just talk a little bit about the uh, current real-time activity that's occurring. Uh, Finish Water 3, uh, which is the pipeline to Portales, uh, it's 17.2 uh, miles of 20-inch diameter PVC pipe. Uh, right now, we've got uh, two-thirds of it complete and are going out to bid uh, this next week uh, on the 16th on the remaining 5.7 miles of that project. That project was done in two phases. Uh, phase one was uh, what we call Finish Water 3A, uh, which was, um, I believe, about 11.5 miles. And then the remainder of it uh, is uh, the, the uh, second phase, which what? which we call Finish Water 3B, and that uh, pipeline goes into town and connects over to the Lime Street uh, uh, pump station facility that the city has there. Uh, Finish Water 1 is uh, the pipeline that uh, connects from the edge of, uh, of Finish Water th uh, 2, the north, uh, north edge of, uh, or the north end of Finish Water 2, and that's over on the northwest side of Cannon Air Force Base. So if you know where Chavez Housing is, it's up on the northwest uh, corner there. Uh, and, and that's where Finish Water 2 ended. This project has been awarded uh, to the contractor uh, on October 27th. Notice to proceed was given on November 28th of 22. And um, <clears throat> right now we're on uh, working on pre-mobilization. Uh, it's underway with uh, construction to begin uh, next month. Uh, with this project, and, and due to supply issues, as we all know and all have been dealing with, we are giving the contractor uh, a time, uh, what we call pre-mobilization, in order for them to prepare uh, their submittals and their uh, RFIs, requests for information, and also to make sure that uh, the uh, supplies and materials are, are are um, locked in and ready to go. Uh, what we don't want to do is to have the contractor come out and start uh, clearing and grubbing and then have to wait several months for pipe to show up. So what we've done with Finish Water 1 is we've requested from, uh, as part of the contract that we, uh, the authority receives a letter from the pipe manufacturer that they will be delivering pipe within 60 days. Uh, once we receive that letter, then we give uh, notice uh, to the contractor to proceed with construction activity. So that is uh, Finish Water 1. Uh, again, that's about a two-year uh, project in completing that 15 and a half miles. That uh, Finish Water 1 will reach uh, uh, to the north uh, to the area where the uh, water treatment plant will be located. The next uh, one bullet uh, that you see below that is called Raw Water 3. And by the way, uh, all of the projects from the reservoir up to the water treatment plant are called raw water, and everything south of the of the uh, the treatment plant to the member communities is called finished water, and that would be uh, potable drinking water. So raw water three is the is the next phase headed north, uh, right north of the uh, where the water treatment plant will be, and that project is um, currently being designed at 100 percent. We're at 90 percent with that now. Easement acquisition is underway, uh, and then the next steps would be bid packaging and then uh, putting out an RFP, and construction will follow. That's uh, 26 miles of 42-inch diameter pipeline. Um, as I mentioned to you, uh, Raw Water 3 begins north end of the proposed water treatment plant and continues to the edge of the cap rock. Uh, the next bullet point there is Texaco lateral, which is 4.4 uh, miles of 8-inch diameter pipe. We are currently working on 100% design on this, and uh, uh, we expect to go out to bid at late summer. Raw Water 2 is the uh, section that goes up or down, however you want to look at it, uh, down the cap rock. Uh, it's about three miles. Uh, subject to change, we may add a little bit uh, more of, of pipeline length uh, to that headed, to headed north. Uh, but right now we're looking at about three miles from the top to the bottom, 42-inch uh, diameter pipe. Uh, right now we have uh, uh, all of the um, uh, right of entry has been obtained. Uh, we're, we're doing geotech work out there now and geophysics uh, and survey work uh, all currently underway. 100% uh, design and easement acquisition will be the next steps 
and then uh, bid packaging and, and uh, of course uh, RFP will and construction will follow that. And then the, uh, the final uh, section of pipeline headed north to the reservoir is called Raw Water One, and that's a 28 mile pipeline of 42 inch diameter, which connects at the, at the base of, uh, of the Cap Rock uh, and, and heads north to the, uh, uh, to the intake facility at Ute Reservoir. Uh, current activity also includes survey work there, uh, geotech and geophysics. 90% uh, design and easement acquisition will be the next steps. And then the remaining 10% of the, de of the design, the bid packaging, packaging and the RFP and construction will follow after that. Um, Elida lateral and pump station, this is a 30 mile pipeline, uh, four to six inches in diameter. Uh, right now we're, uh, we've wrapped up uh, right of way acquisition. 90% uh, design has begun. And again, the remaining 10% comes uh, with the next round of funding. Uh, and then uh, we would go out to construction with that, RFP and construction with that. Um, after that, the last bullet point on this page is the facilities uh, for the uh, system. And that uh, includes the uh, uh, water treatment plant, the cap rock pump station in tank and the intake uh, pump station Land acquisition is currently in progress, and also power to facilities is being planned. Uh, just a few photos here, just to give you an idea of, of how we uh, do things and construction. Um, this is uh, just a photo of the uh, front entrance of the intake facility. Uh, this is a, so a couple of photos of the finished water two pipeline construction that we completed about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago now. Uh, just to uh, kind of give you an idea of how that uh, larger diameter pipeline is installed. Another photo. And another photo there. That's um, a photo of the uh, Cannon Air Force Base lateral vault where we did the uh, lateral uh, cannon lateral connection. Uh, pretty much teed off there to connect uh, cannon and then go on to our uh, main junction vault. And here's the main junction vault. Uh, where it shows uh, the pipeline coming in from the treatment plant, that's uh, finished water two, and then uh, headed north, and then uh, where it tees off into Clovis, Cannon Air Force Base in Texaco, and then to Portales and Elida. That is complete, by the way. That photo was taken during construction. These are what some of our vaults look like under underground. Uh, mostly we're... Uh, uh, where we have valves where we can isolate. Uh, in some cases, there are air vacs where we allow air to, to escape from the pipeline as water travels through, through the pipeline. This is a, um, a vault area at Cannon Air Force Base completed uh, within the, the, uh, the base itself. Uh, here you see a, a few photos uh, of the beginning of a construction project. This is the Finnish Water 3 pipeline to Portales. Some of the first things that the contractors does once we give them permission to, to begin construction is they come in and survey the uh, easement area. We have a permanent easement and then a temporary construction easement. In this case, being the, the 20 inch diameter pipe, we had 50 feet, uh, we have 50 feet of permanent easement and another 50 feet of temporary construction easement, giving the contractor a little more space to work in. Uh, we, we put in a construction uh, fencing at the edge of our easement area where the uh, contractor cannot uh, cross, that, cross that fence. Uh, to one side, what we, what we do is we uh, preserve 18 inches of topsoil where, where we have that ability uh, and put it to one side and then the excavation goes to the other side. Uh, so this is clearing and grubbing right here is what you're seeing. Pipe, pipeline installation, uh, in this case it was 20 inch PVC headed to Portales. You can see the pipeline being uh, installed here, uh, bedding material underneath and on the sides and above, compaction. And then this is a completed vault there on the uh, Finnish Water 3 pipeline to Portales. So you can see what they look like once they're completed. And then this is land restoration. Once we, uh, everything is complete, 
then that 18 inches of topsoil is brought back and, and then uh, grass seed is planted back on the grounds and uh, on, on that easement area and, and uh, we uh, work to restore the land. Another f photo of land restoration. Now I'll just talk a little bit about uh, the funding that we've uh, been able to work with. As uh, many of you know, uh, back in November of, of 2021, the uh, president uh, signed into law the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And in that, uh, there was uh, one, million, one billion dollars uh, toward uh, completing the authorized rural water projects. There were five rural water projects, uh, the Eastern New Mexico rural water system being one of those. Um, uh, once that uh, bill was, was signed into law, then uh, we began working with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation in planning for the distribution of that money uh, towards our projects. And uh, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation said that they would be distributing that, um, that funding over a five-year period beginning in fiscal year 22. Um, that same year, we, uh, we knew that, uh, that funding was going to be coming our way. And, and uh, so uh, with the leadership of our, our board, uh, we went to the legislature to, to ask them for help in meeting their 15% of the funding uh, for this um, overall project. And we did have great success with that. So just a kind of a glance at what we did uh, last year in fiscal year 22, that first year of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding for our project. Uh, we were able to secure $160 million from the uh, uh, Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act funding. An additional 17.4 million came from our, uh, from the uh, the president and our congressional funding, to add to that uh, for a total amount of 177.4 million. Uh, with that same year, uh, uh, with the New Mexico legislative session, uh, we were able to uh, secure, through the help of the governor and our legislators, an additional 30 million of state funding to match that uh, that federal funding. And then uh, the uh, Eastern New Mexico Water Utility Authority has a, an obligation of 10% of match uh, to the project. Uh, with that, they, we uh, sought out uh, uh, borrowing money to meet our match for the overall project. And you can see that in the form of Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund uh, uh, in the amount of $32 million. And then the city of Clovis also... Um, applied for a drinking water state revolving loan fund of $15 million as they were uh, committed to uh, upfronting a portion of their, of their, mem of their uh, match, membership match. Uh, by the way, these, uh, these loans are at 0% interest, uh, tier two funding uh, through dr drinking water. So a total uh, funding for fiscal year 22 really gave us a boost uh, in the amount of $228,140,000. So you could see in that slide that I showed you prior of all of the activity that's going on, this is why we, we are able to, to, to move forward with these projects. Fiscal year 23, which is happening now and which uh, uh, we're under, uh, U.S. Bureau of Reclamation about a month ago announced uh, the funding for year two of five toward our project. Uh, with that, uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding uh, came at uh, 89510000 An additional 4630 came from the uh, president and congressional funding for a total of $94,140,000 for fiscal year 23. That's on top of last year's funding. Uh, Water Trust Board funding, um, we've got an application submitted uh, so far so good uh, at $13.9 million. And then uh, the uh, legislative session for this uh, fiscal year 2023, uh, which just ended, and the um, governor signed into, into law uh, House Bill 2 for $15 million to go towards our project. And then uh, the uh, Eastern New Mexico Water Utility Authority match again at 26260000 So another uh, good year for year number two to keep our project um, on task and on schedule. 
So this is the five-year schedule that we're working with and are committed to uh, staying with and completing the project by the end of this decade, 2029. Uh, so far, two years of this five-year schedule have occurred, as you can see, and we're on schedule, uh, and that is, that is a good thing. So um, just want to touch a little bit on the uh, local economic impact that these projects are bringing to our communities. Just uh, an example is uh, Finished Water 2, the pipeline that uh, we completed about a year and a half ago. Uh, that was a 1.5-year project. Uh, we had about 40 construction jobs on site on average. In some, some months, we had more. Uh, but on average, uh, there were uh, about 40 construction jobs on site. We had uh, about 15 construction administrative and staff jobs off-site that were helping manage the project, uh, either through the contractor or on our end. And then uh, we had uh, four certified welders on-site, underground tunnel crews, um, 20 specialized jobs, as you can see, steel workers, cement finishers, painters, fencing, land restoration, uh, 10 engineers, and support involved with that. Uh, quality control folks, quality assurance inspectors on site, making sure the, the uh, work is de being done to specifications, and then surveyors on site. So with that, uh, numerous e economic activity, including uh, local concrete, local building materials, aggregate materials, fencing, trucking, fuel, and lubricants, seating, hotels, and apartments, uh, New Mexico gross receipts tax to Curry County, City of Clovis, and the state of New Mexico. So, you know, quite a bit of a local impact. We come in and, and we, we get to work and, and, and all of this stuff is happening. Um, uh, Finish Water 3A, which is the pipeline connecting uh, from Finish Water 2 to uh, Portales. Uh, this project was a one-year, 12-month project. 18 construction jobs on site, five construction admin and staff off site, uh, four underground tunnel crew for about two months. Uh, we had 20 specialized jobs on site, um, 10 engineers, uh, quality control and assurance, surveyors, and then again, same thing goes there uh, with uh, the local activity. And then uh, the economic impact, not only to us, but also to, to the U.S. Uh, with that, uh, with the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding available, matched with the state of New Mexico and local funding, we're now able to engage in larger and multiple phases that will generate hundreds of jobs, both on-site and off-site. These phases uh, going forward will generate all types of employment, including manufacturing of materials and supplies, transportation and materials and supplies, engineers, construction and construction management, surveyors, quality control and assurance, construction workers, welders, steel workers, concrete finishers, electricians, painters, and et cetera. So lots of, uh, lots of economic activity. Uh, with that said, I stand for questions if you might have some questions for me. Thank you. Mr. Ortega, thank you. Good presentation. Could you talk just a little bit about the uh, current working group and the water treatment plant that we're uh, working on? Absolutely, uh, Chairman Bryant and members of the committee. Uh, we started uh, back in uh, December, actually it was in November, the, uh, the Eastern New Mexico Water Utility Board of Directors decided that, that we should put a working group together to involve our member communities in, uh, in looking at the different alternatives for water treatment. Uh, we were uh, at, the, at the point where we wanted to, to get started with design uh, on a water treatment plant, uh, but uh, we, we certainly felt that, that we needed the member community's involvement in that because they're gonna be the receivers of this water and we wanted them to understand and to be a part of the decision making or recommendations to our board on what, uh, how this would affect them. So with that, we have had uh, uh, nine different uh, working, uh, work sessions with on average uh, of about 20 uh, uh, participants from all of our member communities. Uh, we've, we've looked at uh, lots of different, uh, uh, different alternatives for water treatment. Uh, actually, we've, we've narrowed it down to four different uh, water treatment uh, alternatives from a conventional to a uh, um, uh, 
uh, uh, filtering, uh, different type of filtering systems, carbon filtering or, or GAC is what they call it, uh, to membrane uh, to reverse osmosis. And because uh, the water at the reservoir uh, has changed over the course of the last uh, 10 years uh, and the levels are lower than, than they have been uh, for, since the last time that we had tested water there, uh, we're looking at higher uh, total dissolved solids in the reservoir. So TDS is not bad for your health, but it does have uh, uh, components in it that affect your your use of, of water. It can be it can be harder on you. Uh, you know, the water can taste a little different. Can can even give an odor at times. Uh, it can it can cause um, scaling on you know on, on windows and glass. It can clog up your water heater. Things like that. Things that we are somewhat accustomed to, but. You know, we, we certainly have been very fortunate that our groundwater is good water and, uh, and, and we haven't had to deal with a whole lot of hard water, quite honestly. Uh, I, I believe all that's been, that's been done to it since, since we, you know, since the beginning of time has been to chlorinate it to make it uh, potable. Uh, so the uh, surface water is a little different than, than groundwater. And, and with that, we, we certainly want to make sure that we've looked at everything uh, that we can to provide a good health, uh, good quality, safe and healthy drinking water to our member communities. So bringing this working group together and bringing experts in to help us to understand and to learn about water treatment has been, has been a, a real success to us. In fact, as I mentioned to you, we've had nine work sessions and some site visits to water treatment plants uh, to see what other people are doing and what we made can do uh, to, to, to provide our member communities the best uh, water possible. Uh, with that, uh, we have looked at uh, the conventional uh, methods. Uh, as I mentioned, the GAC methods, which is a fiber, I mean, a carbon uh, filtering system, and then uh, membranes, and then uh, reverse osmosis. Uh, so with that, we are uh, reaching an end to this work. And uh, I believe uh, we, we do have a meeting scheduled tomorrow with our working group to kind of come up with a final recommendation for our board. Um, but um, at this point, um, the recommendations are uh, up to, the, uh, to this committee tomorrow. And once that occurs, uh, then that will be carried forward to, to the board. Okay. Thank you. Any questions from the committee? Yeah. And, okay. I guess I have to hold this down. Uh, Orlando, thank you for that presentation. I appreciate the work that you're doing in the board. We appreciate that. Where, where are we compared? I believe there's five, four other projects. For example, the Lewis and Clark project in regards to the Infrastructure Investment Jobs Act. Where are we compared to those projects? In completion, you ask, yeah. is that correct? Uh, I believe that, uh, that we have one or two projects that will be completed uh, with this second round of, of the five-year funding. And uh, we have a third and possibly a fourth project being completed with the next round of funding. So basically, after the third year, we're going to be the only ones uh, left. Uh, although, you know, we were the youngest project that came on board uh, with those rural water projects. So um, pretty much as anticipated, we would be the, the remainder of that of that funding. And another question is, where, in your opinion, would we be if the Infrastructure and Events and Jobs Act was not passed by Congress? Uh, we've been asked that question before, and I, I, can, I can tell you that conservatively, I can say that we are shaving off at least 15 to 20 years of, of, the, of time with the Inf Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act funding. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. You yes, you do got to hold it. Okay. Um, <laughs> if you could go back to that slide on the 2022 funding, uh, my question was. Oh. Oh, I way. think they've moved it. But That's maybe okay. They can um, the question was regarding the, the loans that the city of Clovis, and I believe it was the county, had taken out. Uh, yeah, that slide. So if they took out. Um, 
47 million in loans, but the funding only ended up to be 20 million. So if you could just kind of elaborate the, the difference in numbers there for me. Absolutely. Uh, our estimates are showing that, that the member, the 10% member contribution is going to hover around 80 million. So uh, we're, uh, I can tell you that uh, we're, we're, we're doing all of these estimates through engineers' estimates. Uh, every project that I've been involved with has been under budget, and I'm proud to say that. Uh, Finish Water 2, we were about $1.5 million under budget. Finish Water 3A has been uh, about $3 million under budget. So we keep shaving off of these uh, estimates, uh, then that's that much less we have to borrow. Uh, another uh, um, another uh, source of funding that the, the authority borrows from is through Water Trust Board. So when we receive a, an award through Water Trust Board funding, uh, it's no, normally 90% grant, which goes towards the state's 15%, and then 10% loan, which goes towards our 10%. So we have currently have about $4 million in debt through Water Trust Board funding, and uh, about uh, in 2018, um, we actually had more de debt than that. Uh, the board uh, uh, implemented a pay-as-you-go program that actually started paying off these these uh, loans uh, in a quicker fashion. And since 2018, I believe we've paid off four loans uh, that had been accumulating, and uh, and they they really wanted to to eliminate debt because we knew at some point we were going to have to come back and borrow. So um, right now we're looking at 47 million. Uh, plus that five million, uh, so we're we're in that fifty fifty two million dollar range. Our hope is is that we can stay within that fifty to sixty million range uh, if we keep working at it and and being very good at what we do. Then we can certainly hopefully stay under budget with all of our projects. Okay, great, thank you. Welcome. Okay, any, any other questions? No. Okay. Well, Mr. Ortega, thank you. We thank appreciate you. your presentation. Thank very, you. Very good. Okay, we moved down to number five, which is a presentation of enhancing your community's water video from Playa Lakes Joint Venture, and Mayor Morris is going to give that presentation. I know your schedule is busy, so thank you for being here. I appreciate it. Mayor Pro Tem, I, um, I didn't know about this, but... Uh, <laughs> But, but you, like a lot of others, know that I like surprises. <laughs> I, see my, I, just, I just saw it on the I, agenda. I see there. my name there. Uh, it, it is true that, that I uh, gave an interview and wound up in a video uh, about Playa Lakes Joint Venture, uh, which is a nonprofit organization that um, is focused on... The thing that's different about... <laughs> different, Was that the video? <laughs> uh, that, that may be the video. If you were just wanting to show the video, I'm, I, I'll, I'll get out of the way. I didn't have anything prepared. I, I didn't know that. But Playa Lakes Joint Venture is an organization, a nonprofit or organization focused on uh, rehabbing playas and grasslands and, and things like that. Uh, and, and a number of years ago, the city of Clovis and Playa Lakes Joint Venture partnered up uh, to, um, to, I believe, do some restoring and, and reconditioning of the playas around the community so that when we do get rain and there's runoff, that it's getting to the right places and maximizing the recharge that can take place uh, due to playas being healthy and, and that, that water making it, it its way down. Uh, so uh, if, if that does the trick, that's, uh, that, that's the city's relationship with Playa Lake Joint Ventures. And, um, and I think actually in the next uh, presentation from Dr. Clayton, uh, related to the land trust work. Uh, they, Playa Lakes is one of the many uh, grant programs that are available to landowners who have playas on their land as well. Okay. Well, thank you, Mayor. I appreciate yeah. it. I'm sorry to put you on the spot. No, no that's okay. <laughs> ah, appreciate it. Uh, thanks, thanks for allowing right. me to be here. <laughs> okay. Any questions? No? Okay. We'll move on down to uh, number six, which is a presentation regarding the Ogallala land and water. Mr. Chairman, we're going to show the video. Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Yep. Lala Aquifer for their water. However, 
As aquifer levels decline, many towns and communities are searching for solutions to continue providing abundant, clean water for future generations. Water is a very valuable, most valuable product on Earth. You know, you lose your water, you have nothing. The water keeps our local economy going, our feedlot and our hog facilities. If we lose them, you know, then we'll lose maybe our hospitals and uh, schools. If we don't have a robust economy, then we don't have our kids coming back, our population shrinks. Everything revolves around water. Well, without water, you don't have a community. And so to be able to recharge the aquifer is a big deal to us because that just produces sustainability and longevity, um, not only for us, but the next generation and the next after that, too whether it's agriculture or civic or uh, municipalities, uh, everybody's feeling the effects of the aquifer uh, dropping it. In fact, there are already areas of the Ogallala where it's become too uh, difficult to pump water. It, the, the water levels have de decreased to the point where there isn't that much water left in the aquifer and it's too expensive to pump it out. We want to figure out ways to stay in this area. We don't want to be looking for, let's move to another state where there is water. We're talking about a, a regional issue and we need to recharge the aquifer all around us because frankly, our, our wells are all around us. You know, we need everyone working together on this. We need landowners, we need the county, we need the city, everyone working together. The Tomorrow's Water Model helps communities explore ways to provide future water by reducing the impacts from aquifer overuse and increasing groundwater recharge through playas. The purpose of the Municipal Water Initiative is to try to help sustain the water supply for uh, communities where the Belgalo aquifer is running low and uh, projected to be out of water in 50 to 70 years. Because as we think about the, the different tactics we're using to address our water concerns, uh, most of them are about lessening the burden on the aquifer, right? But the Playa Lakes, on the other hand, is an opportunity to actually recharge that aquifer and recharge that resource. It's just an important piece to the overall strategy. Tomorrow's Water is an adaptive, collaborative process in which local communities work with conservation partners to create an actionable plan to stabilize their water supply, with a focus on incorporating playa conservation as part of broader water quantity and quality efforts. Playas um, have a very unique uh, function when it comes to the Ogallala Aquifer. They are the flood control structures for the high plains. The water that collects in those playas, some of that water does percolate down into the Ogallala or the High Plains Aquifer. Especially in the southern part of the playa range, playas are the only recharge areas for the Ogallala Aquifer. Because playas are a primary source of groundwater recharge, they are an important part of a water management plan. Once water use has been reduced, healthy playas can provide future water to support towns and rain fed operations. Healthy playas have a, a few um, basic um, characteristics. One, the basin doesn't have pits or modifications in it. It doesn't have sediment in it. And then the playa itself is surrounded by a good vegetative buffer, usually grass. What's important for people to realize is that they do recharge at a rate that is beneficial to municipalities, the family farm, and anybody living on the landscape in a sustainable way. Recharge rates in playas are 10 to 1,000 times higher than under upland areas. While individual playa rates vary, the average recharge rate across the region is about 3 inches per year. Um, if you take that and put it on a four acre playa, that's three inches of recharge across four acres. That's essentially one acre foot of water when the playa is wet. And one acre uh, foot of water is about 326,000 gallons. That's enough water to provide a family of four a source of clean drinking water for a couple of years. In addition, water reaching the aquifer through playas is of higher quality 
because they act as water filtration systems by keeping contaminants out of the groundwater. It used to be that we looked at wetland services primarily from a wildlife standpoint. And now we, we look at it from a clean water standpoint. They not only help with the quantity of water, but they help with the quality of water making it to the aquifer. As water makes it to the playa, uh, water then gets to infiltrate through the soil beneath it. And so the soil acts as a natural filter for materials that might be in the water that made it to the playa. On the way to the playa, the vegetation that surrounds the playa has a chance also to filter materials before they get to the playa itself. And that can be especially important if you've had that uh, situation where the playa has been dry for a while and those cracks are big. Uh, if the water just comes from the cultivated or uh, land around it, it might carry with it uh, any residues of any chemicals that might have been used on that, that property. Over time, many playas have been modified and are no longer functioning as healthy playas. The number one threat to playas is spilling in through uh, sedimentation. And what that is, is eroded material moving from the upland surrounding playas into the playas and accumulating at a rate quicker than can be blown out of those playas. Uh, you can see that three sides of this playa, the, the north, the west, and the south sides of this playa are, are protected with a buffer. Whereas on the east side, you can see it's not protected. It's a cultivated field. The sediment's coming in and forming a delta of soil on the edge of that playa with not a lot of growth. Every time it rains in the upland or snows, whatever it is, and that runoff comes, it's going to erode down into the lowest spot in the landscape. And the lowest spot in any high plains landscape is most likely going to be a playa. It will fill with sediment and the ground will become more level with the upland and uh, you'll just have buried hydric soils here. and The wetland will lose its function just slowly and slowly and slowly. And but that clay layer exists underneath a playa. When a playa is restored, it can bounce back very quickly. Playa restoration is an important component of the Tomorrow's Water model. In order to provide clean water for future generations, playas need to be healthy with an intact basin, a protective grass buffer, and no excess sediment. In the late 90s, this site was a crop field behind us and it's hard to imagine. You see all the waterfowl out there and the <coughs> wetlands, the water standing, the wetland plants. But this had a couple of huge drainage pits in and had been land leveled. We came in with a contractor. We used engineers to design the project. Soil scientists helped us determine where the fill and the sediment was and scraped that material out, filled the deep pits, and then took the rest of the material, rebuilt the road, so uh, we worked with the county road department here, so they were happy. They ended up with a better road, and then we took the rest of the material and put it on the hillside over here, and then planted this back to uh, high quality native prairie. Have you heard of the powerful method to achieve almost 2020 vision without surgery? The best part is that it... Although playas are a primary source of recharge, Irrigation greatly exceeds recharge from playas, so the Tomorrow's Water model also includes strategies for reducing aquifer overuse and managing runoff within playa watersheds. Playas are just one aspect of it. Uh, maybe cutting back on the irrigation or retiring some of these irrigation wells so we have sustainable water for these communities I think is a big factor. One of the things we see in the Southern High Plains of Texas is as people run out of water, they, they use less irrigation water. They irrigate fewer acres, they change their cropping, they make decisions to, instead of going for cotton, they might go after some more specialty crop, uh, might head toward grapes for wine or, or other things for other purposes. So there is a, a chance for them to adjust the way they use their water in their land. There are some really innovative conservation strategies that people are working on. And in this part of the world, it's going to double with water conservation at the same time. Working to be more uh, efficient with water use and using less water, uh, whether it's, you know, for whatever crop that they're, they're trying to produce. 
Um, so some people, it, it feels like, are going to be probably transitioning out of row crop into uh, perhaps more livestock operations, getting reestablishing grass. And so depending on markets and how that rainfall patterns and irrigation success in the future, some of that may really switch pretty quickly to a non-row crop, more of a grass production and grazing operation, which might mimic more historical patterns of, of land use in this part of the world. When nearby irrigation is reduced or turned off, some communities have found that water levels in the aquifer rebound. Yeah, I've got one friend, I'll give you an example. He, his family quit irrigating their farm about 20 years ago. Um, there's like six plies around their property. And the wells, according to him, over a 20 year period, the water levels come up 10 foot in their wells. One landowner said it best when he said, if we can get to sustainable with irrigation, then your ply has become very, very important. And he was right about that. For example, in this Texas town, if all the playas within two miles of municipal wells were restored, the potential recharge through those playas is enough to provide future drinking water for 63% of the population. Long-term economic viability um, for many agricultural operations on the Southern High Plains is going to depend on playas and having healthy functioning playas. We want it to use the water as best as we possibly can because it's our most valuable resource in this area and we need to do everything we can as a community and so it's going to take the surrounding areas and not just the city. Well, these playa lakes do contribute to uh, Ogallala recharge and especially around some of these communities they're wondering like where are we going to get water a hundred years from now and these things could uh, seriously play a uh, role in solving that problem. My advice to other cities and towns and other mayors would be have a plan, work that plan, keep an open mind and uh, be ready to implement new ideas that come along such as uh, leveraging Playa Lakes as a way to recharge the aquifer. By using the Tomorrow's Water model, communities can develop a plan that includes reducing aquifer overuse, restoring playas, and managing runoff within playa watersheds. For more information about Tomorrow's Water and how playas can be part of your community's water management plan, contact Playa Lakes Joint Venture. We can help guide communities through the process of scoping a situation developing a plan, and implementing a solution. Very good video. It just shows how important playas are to our aqu aquifer. So thank you. Any questions, comments? Nope. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to our next presentation, which is regarding the Ogallala Land and Water Conservancy with a former city commissioner, Dr. Donna Clayton. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem, also chairman and members of the commission. Thanks so much for allowing me to be here to talk about where we're at with the Ogallala Water, um, Land and Water Conservancy and, and what we've accomplished thus far with a lot of work still ahead of us. I'm gonna move right through these slides and give you highlights as we go. So as of April 30th, 2022, we had shut down 51 irrigation wells and that was well in advance of actually paying out the lease payments that were due to those landowners because they had a strong willingness to shut off early and we were thrilled with that decision and that support. We had two wells remaining to cease pumping um, because it was under lease, the land was under lease until September 1st, so we were able to capture those other two on September 1st. All together, after we metered the water, which we did meter every single well out there in uh, the designated area of that paleo channel, 7,559 total gallons per minute of water production was what we um, were able to capture. And if you look at how much you're conserving annually, 
with that amount of water, you've got um, 3 billion, 973 million, 10,400 uh, gallons of water or 12,193 acre feet. So if you look over the three year lease term, which is what we're working under, you're almost at 12 billion gallons of saved water or almost 37,000 acre feet of water. That is going to be very significant to our water supply because the Ogallala Land and Water Conservancy, as you know, was created to actually provide a supplemental groundwater source. And it is Cannon Air Force Base that came to the table due to mission resiliency. It was being adversely affected and threatened due to water decline at the Ogallala Aquifer. So that is a major partner for us in working um, on this goal. The current annual lease payments we made for year one is 1.792 million. Our current funding comes from all of these sources and every penny is significant. So you have REPI, which is the Department of Defense. You have RCPP dollars on the table from NRCS. We have state funding also now that's been awarded to us, and then we function operationally thanks to the city and the county. So we cannot have our doors open and do what we do if it were not for the city and the county because you're paying our overhead expenses in order to make all of this happen. So our total current funding with the latest uh, award of $400,000 from a second REPI award is $16,306,511. This is just a breakdown for you of how we have um, the wells represented by landowners. So you have 10 who ceased irrigation in Paleo 1 for 53 wells. And then we appraise that value of the wet water. I mean, it had to be appraised in order to determine what we could pay, and it was in a range. So everyone's appraisal was individualized, independent, and done by a certified appraiser. That range on the wet water was $208 up to $245 per gallons per minute of water production. So the example I'm providing you is if you had 2,000 gallons per minute and your value came in at $224, then your lease payment was $448,000. We still have three landowners, which represents two families, not under water right lease agreement in Paleo 1, and that represents 16 wells. And then in Paleo 2, we have four landowners, and that represents 23 irrigation wells, and we're working in that Paleo channel now. We're also involved in risk mitigation because if we're really going to secure and have a supplemental water supply, we need to know that we're taking good care of it. So one of the first things we did and committed to the Department of Defense was to complete well erosion prevention to protect the wells from contamination. So we've had all the rock delivered out to all of the landowners currently and they will actually complete the contamination prevention on each one of those wells. So we're using rock and um, it's caliche rock and we're also using some caliche fines and some dirt to actually create that. And some of our landowners are, have already implemented it, but the rest will complete by the end of this month. We're also preparing to install hour meters and timers in all wells that will be pumped monthly or bi-monthly for well maintenance. We only have three landowners who want to do that. The rest of them determined they would completely shut off and not do maintenance. For those who are doing maintenance, we have to determine that they can only use the amount of water that was allowed in the water right lease agreement. So that you know, was vetted highly at the highest level at the Air Force in Washington and um, at AFCHEC, uh, Air Force Civil Engineer Center out of San Antonio. We had attorneys looking at it from that side and also Peter Nichols from our side to ensure that we held the line on how much water could be used. So it's up to four hours a month of pumping or on a rolling average. Also, we are engaged with NRCS, uh, the National Resource Conservation Center. And as you may know, the um, 
New Mexico Association of Conservation Districts actually sought, applied for, and was awarded a sizable um, grant of money, about $6.495 million. So they took that money in order to support this project. And as of March 28th, the press release just came out from the USDA Natural Resource Conservation Service announcing an April 28th deadline for these amounts of money. So land management contracts will be funded at 1.768 million, and then entity held conservation easements will be held, um, will be funded at 3.4 million. The entity holding those will actually be the Texas Agriculture Land Trust, our mentoring conservancy trust, and we will co-hold those with them until we have been vetted long enough to then take them. This is the actual area that was in the publication on Project 2553, the New Mexico Ogallala Preservation and Conservation Project area, as you can see, is in that large kind of rectangular, triangular at the top area. Those red parcels you see happen to be the ones that we are working with directly. Also, while we're doing all of that work, we completed well measurements because we contracted with Dr. Jeff Rawling and his team out of the New Mexico Bureau of Geology and Mineral Resources, and they have completed all their well measurements. They identified 99 wells to go and measure. Unfortunately, only 62 of those were actually measurable or even accessible in some cases. We included in those wells, the wall wells, the snail wells, we tried to do a, a large area so we could get a great mapping out there of the aquifer. So they did complete 62, and this is going to give us data on the water table and the groundwater storage estimates, and those, Visits were conducted in December and January. All the data analysis will be completed by September 2023, and I'm really excited to see what that data shows. And we will be provided with full presentations, charts, maps, and all, all the data that you know Dr. Rawling does so well. We also continue to pr pursue funding. The last time I even presented to the city, you know, we did not have our 501c3, but we are now a 501c3. We were awarded that finally in November of 2022. So that's a difference maker for us because we couldn't apply for quite a lot of grants without that designation, but now that door is open to us. We're gonna pursue funding from the Land of Enchantment Legacy Fund, which becomes available 2024. That was just um, approved in this legislative session. And we're excited about that. That's a lot of funding availability, although only about 25 million of the 100 million that's been identified will be available for groups like us. So those who have conservation projects on the ground in motion, we be able to apply for those funds. We're continuing to partner with um, the Air Force Civil Engineer Center and REPI Cannon to pursue more REPI funds. We have another really significant opportunity coming up September 2023. It's due then. We're already beginning to work on that, and I'm helping for the first time with the writing of that proposal. And then we're doing something rather significant that we're very excited about, and that's we're going to apply to be designated as the first Sentinel landscape in New Mexico. There is not one here. There never has been one. Sentinel Landscape started in 2013. The first one is in Washington. And Arizona has one. Texas has one. Altogether, there are 11 of these. What does that do for us? It opens up USDA funding, Department of Interior funding, more Department of Defense funding, and multiple other smaller funding sources. They, they begin to partner with us, they begin to work with us because a sentinel landscape is designated as we're trying to protect missions. So that's what we're doing. We're working closely with Cannon Air Force Base about that mission's resiliency. And that positions us as a sentinel landscape possibility, but we have to apply for it. The beauty for us is, and I've spoken with different state uh, representatives who are very excited about this. Um, I should say state agencies, not representatives. They're excited about us applying for this because we already have on the table local support. 
and local support plays a key role in being awarded the Sentinel Landscape designation. So we can say we have city funding, county funding, in addition to federal funds and state funds. Once we're designated as a Sentinel Landscape, money follows that also and helps with the administrative side. So that's another benefit to being a Sentinel Landscape. But just being one, it really puts us on the map nationally and internationally in this endeavor that we're pursuing. We're also looking at grant.gov. I go up there frequently. There are lots of water conservation grants there, and I'm looking at there are two I'm getting ready to pursue. Uh, this is just a quick overview for you of presentations. There have been, I've been trying to be out there and taking up uh, invitations to come and speak to different groups. Uh, naturally, I will be speaking to the Curry County Commission tomorrow. I'm speaking to you today, but I've uh, provided presentations to the Ranch Land Trust of Kansas, the Environmental Defense Fund of Texas, the Middle Rio Grande Water Advocates out of Albuquerque, I've also presented to the Indivisible SOS um, in Santa Fe. And one of the most exciting presentations recently was at the Texas Land Conservation Conference in Austin, Texas. And let me just say, they, our concept, what we're doing here in Little Curry County, New Mexico, was met with uh, applause and a lot of excitement because Texas finds themselves in the same position we're in. They really need to be able to come up with innovative ideas to conserve their groundwater. Um, presenting to you today, and then I will be presenting the Playa Lakes Joint Venture Annual State Conference in Angel Fire, New Mexico on June 27th. And as was mentioned by Mayor Morris, we are working currently with Playa Lakes to look at the almost 100 playas we have in our two areas Paleo 1 and Paleo 2, and how many of those can be restored to fully functional, because we do understand the significant difference that could make. And we're about to engage in conservation easement training, because here we are, and we're about to move into these conservation easements. Ours are different, because we are conserving the groundwater that underlies the land, and traditionally, conservation easements are about the land but our highest greatest interest is that groundwater and putting that groundwater in a conservation easement in perpetuity at least 80 percent of it and letting the landowners maintain 20 percent of that groundwater so we'll be having training with central curry swcd on april 13th and then darren clark is coming all the way from san antonio texas to work with our landowners on the 20th of april so that he can give them a workshop about conservation easements, the benefits, the pros, the cons. And I wanna hand you out um, one thing before I entertain questions. Um, I'm on the water task force and this has really been enlightening for me. It's been helpful to understand the overall big picture for the state of New Mexico, but also what impact and influence we can have here from Clovis Curry County. And so um, the chair of that group put together a great little 2023 legislative outcome summary of all the things and our work that we did and then actual bills that were, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. All the bills that were um, passed that were brought forward because of that work. It was an intense <laughs> undertaking. We started in June and uh, we were all the way down to the line, February, March, trying to get things moving, and then we stayed through with the legislative session. But I just wanted you to have an overview of that, just an FYI. And that's Dr. it. Dr. Clayton, thank <laughs> yeah, you. You bet, thank you. Appreciate the presentation and uh, all your hard work on this such important project. Thank you it's so a much. great conservation project. Thank you, I appreciate it. Any questions from the committee? LaDonna, do you know if, I know that there was a concern through Cannon Air Force Base on the water levels. Yes. Uh, if I could refer you, I don't know if you were aware, we, EPCOG completed with Mr. Uh, Dr. Rowling in New Mexico Tech, a source water protection pro plan. 
Curry and Roosevelt were the first bi-county source water protection plan in partnership with the city of Clovis, city of Portellas, Curry County, Epcog, and uh, the Drinking Water Bureau. But anyway, um, one of the concerns was the water levels in the wells at Cannon Air Force Base. I understand since the city of Clovis bought those 10 wells uh, several years ago, we had, had received a report that those wells had increased some. Do you have any knowledge or any information as to how they're doing? Uh, they're not. They're not faring as well as they were faring the wall wells. No, so they've d done some de decline now. Uh, I'll be anxious to see what they do since we shut the water off on the areas that we just shut the water off in. But we know that the Cannon wells from August 2021 to August 2022 dropped two feet. We already know that for a fact. And we're including all the data from those wells because Cannon's been kind to share that information with us. I'm not talking wall wells, but Cannon wells. We're including that data in the research of Dr. Rawling. But right now, the wall wells have actually declined. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Any other questions? If not, thank you. Appreciate mm -hmm. your presentation. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay, we'll move on to number seven, which is the updates, and we'll start with the EPCOR update from Mark Huerta. Thank you, Mark, for being here today. Uh, Mr. Chair and committee members, um, with April being Water Conservation Month, um, just uh, would want to put some uh, kind of emphasis on our uh, conservation efforts uh, that we uh, have in place and have for, you know, many years now. So we always uh, look at this, it's a year round thing for us. So we, we provide a lot of conservation information through uh, maybe bill and search, direct mailers, print media. We do a lot of radio spots, particularly during the summertime, which is our, our pumping season. Um, we uh, still provide our uh, conservation rebates uh, to our customers. So there's a number of rebates that we provide. Uh, there's a toilet rebate for replacing, you know, high-use toilets with uh, new low-flow toilets. Uh, washing machine rebates for purchase of uh, high-efficiency washers uh, that use less water. Uh, landscape rebates, uh, which uh, is for replacing high-use uh, turf and plants with zero-scaping and things that use less water. And then we introduced, uh, most recently, a uh, water uh, catch barrel uh, rebate. So you go out, you purchase a barrel to... Uh, you know, catch rainwater and be able to use that for, you know, watering your plants, gardens and such. So those are all available uh, still. Encourage people to, to take advantage of those. Um, and again, we provide a lot of conservation information at our website. Uh, you can also order like uh, conservation kits for your home and audit kits that can, uh, you know, help you find leaks maybe in your toilet, you know, offer low flow shower heads, hose nozzles, you know, for when you're uh, doing your watering and things outside. And then, of course, uh, we always ask, uh, now that we're getting into watering season, that people follow the uh, watering schedule, so odd and even number days watering, and then, uh, of course, no watering on Mondays, so things of that nature. Uh, we've had a lot of success with our conservation uh, efforts, and, and that's evident in our reduction in demand over the last uh, you know, several years since we started introducing those things. Uh, so conservation works, and you know, encourage people uh, to continue on with that. Uh, something new that we're going to introduce this year, it'll be our first one, is a water carnival. And so we're shooting for, I believe it's August 26th at Hillcrest Park, and that'll be from 10 to 2. And really what that's going to be is we're, we're trying to put together a fun event where you can bring out your family, you know, wife and kids, spend some time out there, have some fun, but also learn about conservation. Uh, so we're working with the city. Uh, we've been working with Claire over at the city some, hope to partner with the chamber uh, and, and uh, you know, some other folks around town to get that planned out. Uh, and then, you know, if it goes well, hopefully that's something that we continue to do, you know, in future years. So just something fun for, for everybody to come out and do. And then, uh, you know, as far as activities, uh, we just recently completed and are, we'll be bringing online a new well this year, uh, another lease well uh, that's uh, going to provide us about 350 gallons per minute. So it's it's good well, a lot of promise to it. Uh, we're also working on a couple of lease wells uh, with the city of Clovis uh, in Hillcrest Park. So we're uh, actively in design of those now. Uh, so those will be the next one we'll be shooting to bring online. Uh, and then we've got a couple others that we're looking at in future years uh, to continue on with our lease well program and bringing on additional sources of groundwater. 
Uh, and then, of course, we've uh, recently completed the line extension out to the airport. I think that was a little over three miles, a 12-inch. Uh, so we're now serving the uh, Clovis Airport. Uh, and uh, so that was a great project. And, and as part of that, we're also in design of the uh, what will be the te Texaco metering facility, meter vault. So that'll be the connection point for the uh, Eastern Mexico Water Utility Authority to connect to and then continue that Texaco lateral on in to serve the community of Texaco. Uh, on an interim basis, uh, we'll be able to provide them water until uh, the surface water is available and then we'll use that as, as our system to wheel water on into Texaco. So uh, we're currently in design of that. Uh, also, uh, US 6084 East project that uh, I, I think is gonna be the next big one to start. Uh, we've uh, completed design for that, so we have a lot of water infrastructure improvements that'll take place during the construction of that. Uh, currently, right now, we're working on 7th Street, so there's uh, drainage projects I'm sure everybody's aware of on, on 7th Street. So we took advantage of that uh, to replace some aged uh, old six inch cast iron line. We're gonna replace that with new eight inch PVC. I believe we're uh, providing a couple infill hydrants and replacing some older hydrants along that uh, construction corridor. So uh, very similar to what we've done with, with previous uh, road projects. Uh, we, uh, we get in there while the roads tore up and you know improve our system as well. Um, and then there's US 6084 middle project, which we don't actually have a date for that one, but we have already completed design for that. So when that does kick off, we'll be prepared to do the same. Uh, so that's, that's good. It, it's uh, going to be uh, crucial in improving fire flows and stuff, particularly in that downtown area uh, part of town. So we've got that going on. And then, you know, a lot of seeing some uh, uh, growth with uh, residential uh, and new subdivisions. So we've got um, one being built, a couple larger ones that are going on right now. One's called Morning Star. That's uh, right there by Faith Christian uh, Family Church. And then there's one across the street from that, which is Colonnade Village Unit 1. Uh, so pretty good size line extension. So we're working with the contractors on those. And then we've got some several smaller ones that we're working on. Uh, so seeing some growth in there and, and, and that's, that's always promising to see that. So uh, certainly staying busy, much like everyone else. But, uh, that's uh, for me, that's all I've got and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you, Mark, appreciate it. Something you said at the first of your uh, update, uh, you say conservation needs to be a year round project, which I completely agree with. Uh, I just appreciate EPCOR's partnership with the city of Clovis so thank you. Something else was on the rebates that you were talking about. How's the participation been with, with the rebates? Um, so it, it's tapered off some. Uh, I think for 2022, we processed a little over 20 of the toilet rebates. So that remains to be our most popular one. Uh, I think we did a, a little over uh, maybe 12 or 14 of the landscape rebates. Um, the washer rebates were uh, the, probably the least utilized. Uh, I think we only processed about four or five of those in 2022. And then I think since we introduced the rain catch barrels, we've done about five of those. Uh, but you know, again, I, I sort of joked at the at the committee uh, commission meeting, you know, that if we get enough of those out there, maybe it'll rain. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> encourage people to take advantage of all of our rebates. Uh, and again, that information can be found on our website, but I mean, I, I think they're really great. And, and uh, like I said, conservation for us, is, it's very evident in, in our reducing demand that we are seeing and uh, uh, with uh, the Clovis's reuse system and getting a lot of the parks and, and, uh, and such off of uh, irrigated, um, you know, city water. So uh, all that stuff just plays into further, you know, ensuring that aquifer uh, right. longevity, right? And you said they can acquire that information online or by calling EPCOR's yeah, office? Yeah, absolutely. Come in and see us. You know, of course, our offices are open from 9 to 3, Monday through Friday. So, you know, plenty of way to get, get the information. Okay. Any questions for Mark? No. Okay, thank you, Mark. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Okay, we'll move down to our city update with Mr. Howalt. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. As uh, Mark mentioned, we are definitely getting into irrigation season, and that definitely shows on our uh, reuse system. And so for the month of March, we delivered 12.4 million gallons 
uh, of water and how that compares to March of last year uh, we delivered 5.5 million gallons uh, it seems like a significant uh, increase and it definitely is but we also uh, from that time till now uh, brought on two uh, major end users which were the golf course and uh, Green Acres Park and so uh, for the month of March between those two facilities alone we delivered about six million gallons to um, to those two facilities with 4.8 going to the golf course and about 1.2 going to Green Acres Park. The significance of Green Acres is that it was, uh, wasn't on a well prior to the installation of the reuse system. Um, and so it was uh, being irrigated with uh, potable water, uh, obviously provided by EPCOR. And so you can see the significance that uh, us bringing on the reuse system to end users that are on uh, potable water versus well water it will make on the overall uh, system for EPCOR. And so uh, we were essentially able to reduce the demand on their system by 1.2 million gallons uh, in the month of March. As far as future construction projects, of course, uh, we don't have any currently going on uh, with the reuse system, but are in process with uh, still continuing on with our application uh, with the Water Trust Board. Um, as Orlando uh, mentioned uh, during his presentation, uh, the, the legislature did approve the projects going forward uh, to be uh, presented to the Water Trust Board. We were on that. Uh, they are scheduled for May the 3rd uh, to determine the final funding recommendations to the New Mexico Finance Authority. So we'll continue to uh, work with them and keep our eyes out uh, for that upcoming uh, Water Trust Board meeting, like I said, on uh, May the 3rd. And of course, Mark mentioned the completion of the airport project, so I won't need to update you on that. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Any questions? No? Thank you. Good report. Okay. For the good of the order, Mayor Morris. Thanks, Mayor Pro Tem. Brian, appreciate that. Uh, I just want to, I want to congratulate you on a great meeting this morning. Thank you. If you, if we just work backwards in, in your agenda and look at, look at who we've heard from and what we've heard, the city's reuse uh, system delivering how many more million gallons of water? Uh, this this current month or this current month or March was 12 million gallons. 12 million gallons of reuse, and so that's you know uh, that's so instrumental in in us achieving our water sustainability goals. Our amazing partnership with EPCOR as our utility provider here. The uh, presentation on the uh, conservation of water out near Cannon Air Force Base, the Playa Lakes, Playa Lakes joint venture uh, piece, and then of course the uh, U pipeline Eastern New Mexico Water Utility uh, presentation. These, these projects are all so important in us achieving water sustainability. I, like you all up there and, and all of us here, believe in Clovis in this region. We believe that that the economy will continue to grow and that, that, that you know, the goal is, is that we're a prosperous, thriving community and region 20, 30, 50, 100 years from now. But to, to do that, we, we, we've got to address water. And these partners that you've pulled together here this morning, these partnering organizations are, are, are doing that. We're doing that work. If you talk to anybody around the state of New Mexico, leaders from other counties and communities, you know, water supply is, is one, an issue, two, not many of them are doing a heck of a lot about it, right? And, and then if you look at the whole Southwest, you know, water supply is going to increasingly be an issue, but we're doing the heavy lifting and getting it done here. And so I just uh, applaud you on bringing everyone together, and I applaud each of these partners, Dr. Clayton, Mr. Ortega, Mr. Huerta, uh, everyone, thank you for what you're doing for us to reach the, the goals. And, and, and sometimes the work along the way gets, gets contentious. We argue over well, if this is the better idea or this is the better idea, but let's keep the prize in, in view, and that is a prosperous, healthy community. And for that, we need a sustainable water supply 50, 75, 100 years from now. So thank you for, uh, for the meeting this morning, and thank you to these partners. Appreciate you. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate it. I also want to thank uh, all of you for coming coming in this morning to give updates and presentations. It's uh, very important to hear exactly what's going on within our community and how we are continuing to provide a sustainable water supply and conserve water. Anything else? Mr. Chairman, uh, just to, uh, Another important meeting coming up on Thursday, April the 13th, uh, 10 o'clock, is the New Mexico Base Military Planning Commission. Uh, right. We'll be meeting at the uh, upstairs at the General Conference. Okay.
Okay, thank, thank you. Write that down, so I'll forget it. Okay, date, date and time of our next meeting will be 8.30 a.m. Monday, July the 10th, and will be held here in the North Annex, and we are adjourned.